Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for bearing with us. Um, hopefully you found us with the updated link that we sent out. Um, and please share it if you would, so that anyone who may have the old link will get the new link. Um, of course, anyone can go to the YouTube page as well to find it. Um, so I'm Jen Shanger from the New Jersey Autism Center of Excellence, the NJ ACE, which is funded in part by the New Jersey Governor's Council and the New Jersey Department of Health. We're here today with Professor Alicia A. Broderick um, from Montclair State University, and also our director, Professor Liz Torres, has joined us since it's such an important issue. So thank you, both of you. Um, I have a couple of notes. I know that we may have some people who are joining us for the first time. So if you're new here, um, be sure to subscribe to the YouTube page because it will allow you to ask questions in the chat. Um, and it'll also help you to get reminders for other events. Um, we're also trying out a new feature today that will allow us to hopefully share some of the questions right onto the screen. And uh, we'll have that link in the chat as well, um, but you can use either. Um, we just can't post questions on the screen if it's not in that separate link. Um, and um, today, Dr. Broderick is going to present, and then we will have Q&A with Dr. Torres as well. And uh, we do have live captionings enabled right now. They'll be updated in a couple of days so that they are ADA compliant and as precise as possible. Um, and um, today, we are actually giving out uh, e-copies of Dr. Broderick's book. We have 30 copies available. Um, it's going to be first come first serve. So if you would like to uh, have the chance um, to get a copy, uh, we'll have a survey link that we're going to put into the chat. Um, and again, it'll be uh, first come first serve. Um, as always, we love knowing more about you. We would love to hear where you're watching from. So if you're comfortable, please feel free to share. Um, with all of that said, I would love to introduce Dr. Alicia A. Broderick, who is a professor of education at Montclair State University. She's a disability studies scholar and a scholar of critical autism studies. For the past two decades, she's published critical scholarship on autism, deploying, deploying a variety of interdisciplinary conceptual frameworks, including critical discourse analysis, rhetoric, cultural studies, and historically situated analyses of ideology, metaphor, and narrative. Her present analysis synthesizes and reframes much of her extant work by deploying the overarching epistemologi epistemological and ontological lens of neoliberal capitalism in analyzing the shifting meanings of autism within capitalism over the past 75 years. Um, and just to say again to all of you watching, as you know, this is the first day of Autism Acceptance Month. Um, Dr. Broderick is going to be telling us why that matters to all of you and <laughs> what you need to understand. Um, so welcome, Dr. Broderick, and thanks for being here, Dr. Torres, as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jen, and thank you, Liz, and to everyone at the NJACE. And I, I apologize for giving you the, the bio that was um, had a pretty heavy vocabulary load in it. I promised that I, um, I uh, crafted this presentation to be uh, somewhat more accessible and conversational um, so that we can have a good chat about what's going on. Um, so the title of my talk today, as, as uh, Jen just said, is Autism Awareness Counterprogramming, uh, Raising Public Awareness of the Autism Industrial Complex. Um, and the icon there is the copy of um, my recent book of the same title that I'm going to be drawing on in our conversation today. Acknowledgements, I just want to begin by saying the first two authors of my book are actually co-authored with my dear friend and colleague, Robin Resigno. Um, so some of the, the conceptual work around the autism industrial complex is work that we developed together. Um, I want to acknowledge that and, and thank Robin very much for the generative and ongoing collaboration. Um, also, thanks to my publisher, Myers Ed Press and Stylish, Pub, Stylish Publishing. And full disclosure, I also want to just let everyone know that um, Dr. Torres, Liz Torres from NGAs, did read an advanced copy of the text for me very, very generously and offered a generous endorsement of it, um, which is on the back cover. So thank you for, for that, Liz and um, Jen and everybody else, Joe at NJ Ace for the opportunity to share it today. But I wanted to give that disclosure. 
Okay, so first, why counter programming, right? Why is this talk titled Autism Awareness Counter Programming? Um, Autism Awareness Month has been observed in the US um, in the month of April for more than 50 years now. Um, <clears throat> but as many of you probably are already well aware, um, about 15 years ago, autism awareness in the US took on a, a very different tenor. Uh, it became much more slickly produced in terms of media, in terms of marketing and PR, um, and it became much more ominous as well. Also, um, autism awareness um, began globalizing. Um, the awareness agenda was globalizing via the media platform that we're gonna talk about in a few minutes, um, but also specifically and particularly was, was launched to a global platform through the introduction of a UN resolution. Um, establishing World Autism Awareness Day um, on April 2nd annually, which that's been in place since 2008 was the first observance of that. So again, to come back to the counter-programming, um, for all of these years, we've mostly had quote unquote autism awareness initiatives, autism awareness activities. And particularly in the last 15 years or so, most of those initiatives have appeared to aim to be raising awareness of signs or symptoms of autism as, um, as, a, as a disease or as a disorder, um, as a problem. Most of these awareness activities have been framed within uh, what's called the medical model of disability, right? A medical conceptualization of autism. Um, most of these initiatives have really, really perpetuated uh, stigmatizing stereotypes and in many cases made them actually worse. Um, typically speaking, most of these awareness activities, um, not only for the past 15 years, but for the past 50 odd, um, have generally reflected almost entirely allistic perspectives, that is non-autistic perspectives. And because of that, they have oftentimes additionally been ableist as well. So within these traditional autism awareness conceptualizations, the problem, if you will, um, that people are endeavoring to raise awareness of is autism itself. Autism is the problem that we're trying to um, raise awareness of. Um, so most autism acceptance alternative activities um, aim to raise acceptance and valuing of autistic experience, autistic identity, autistic pride, draw primarily on, um, on a social model of disability or a cultural identity model even of disability, mostly set out to sort of challenge or refute stigmatizing stereotypes, uh, really, really seek to foreground and highlight um, autistic perspectives and do explicitly anti-ableist work. And within many of these acceptance initiatives, the problem is ableism itself. Um, and also the problem is simply that people um, do not um, appreciate value and understand autistic perspectives. This presentation is neither of those things. Okay, so if you came ex expecting either an autism awareness talk or an autism acceptance talk, I'm very sorry, I'm going to disappoint you and I do hope you'll stay and maybe you'll find some value in what I do anyway. So this April, it's our April 1st today, right? Happy spring, happy April. This April, you are going to once again see for the next month, the now familiar icons and the ritualized observances that have marked April as Autism Awareness Month for decades now. You've probably already seen the puzzle pieces, the lighted up blue campaign, uh, the now rainbow themed branding of the ribbons and the puzzle pieces and the t-shirts and all the kitsch, um, the bracelets, all of that. But perhaps most importantly, and really most ubiquitously, you've probably also seen the fundraising campaigns. Um, you might be asked to take the pledge, you might be asked to celebrate differences, maybe even a few people are still asking you to learn the signs. But here's what you're less likely to see or to hear about this month, and I believe it's one of the most important things that we need to be talking about and raising our critical awareness of, and that is the industrial scale commodification of autistic people and how many of these initiatives, whether they be awareness or, or even acceptance in some cases um, through appropriation are actually part of that um, money-making process. So what's commodification? I'm gonna to try to explain my uh, 50 cent vocabulary words as I go, as my grandmother would have said. Um, commodification is the process by which ideas or objects or even in some cases people, in this case people, are turned into or transformed into things of some economic value. 
right? So things that can be appropriated to buy or sell or trade or consume. Things that can be used to market or to brand things that people are already buying or selling or trading or consuming. Um, commodities are, are the things that, that animate industries. So this is Walmart um, capitalizing on the commodification of autism. This is not the commodification of autism per se, but this is Walmart a little bit raking in on it because if you've got an, um, an autism advocate doll with her uh, noise reduction headphones and her puzzle piece bracelet and her fidget spinner, um, probably you can charge a little bit more for that doll than for a non-autistic doll that doesn't have the paraphernalia with it, right? So there's a money-making opportunity on autism. And while Autism Awareness Month has been observed and celebrated for, as I said, more than 50 years, the last decade and a half's awareness initiatives and their fear-mongering rhetoric, um, you've heard it all before, autism is an enemy, it's an epidemic, it's coming for your children. All of that was masterfully crafted, I argue, to very purposefully to generate a market of willing and eager consumers and by that, I mean consumers of autism intervention products. I don't call that raising awareness. I call that manufacturing a market. Since at least 2011, um, autistic communities have decried these events every April um, and autistic people have instead advocated for accepting and valuing of autistic experience and for nurturing and supporting autistic agency, autistic liberation and autistic pride. And as of last year, um, by 2021, many, though still not all, of the largest autism advocacy organizations um, have had jettisoned their autism awareness activities and they rebranded them to get on board with April as Autism Acceptance Month. Um, many of those organizations are also quite busily appropriating the language and the iconography of neurodiversity um, into their own PR, their own logos and their own brands, for example. You're all familiar with the rebrand, the Autism Speaks Puzzle Piece rebrand. It's now rainbow um, to represent neurodiversity, right? Um, this is the National Autistic Society in the UK. Um, that is their, their symbol, their icon is one half of the, inf the neurodiversity infinity symbol. Okay, so we can see the rebrand, we can see the appropriation. Um, but before we celebrate um, this apparent embracing of, of autism acceptance, right? Before we celebrate this as a victory for autistic activism, um, let's ask why, or at least let's ask why now? Why this kinder, gentler shift to autism acceptance, to a, a sudden valuing of neurodiversity when, you know, 10 years ago they were trying to eradicate it, right? Um, and perhaps, perhaps as a society, we have genuinely experienced growth. Um, that's almost certainly true to a certain extent, but I do not believe that to be the only reason. The other answer um, is that it now actually benefits the autism industries to rebrand, and it is a rebrand, right? Um, and to some extent, the new brand of valuing autistic people, that branding, right, um, serves at least in part, I argue, to obscure the value of autistic people as commodities for the autism industries. It's about the money. <laughs> it has always been, and it always will be about the money. So within autism commerce, autistic people, including very young children of 12, 18, 24 months of age, have become the raw materials of the very profitable, booming, and ever-diversifying autism industries. The biggies include the Applied Behavior Analysis, or ABA, industry, um, about to be booming, uh, the autism pharmaceutical industry, and there are multiple others, right? And the central engine driving the growth of these multi-billion dollar year industries, as with all other industries, of course, is their vast potential for profit. So every autistic two-year-old sets in motion a chain of commercial transactions, right? We have consultations, evaluations, diagnoses. There are infinite varieties of therapies and supports and services and counseling and other kinds of interventions. There are pharmaceuticals, even research dollars. In some cases, even things like specialized litigation firms, right? Um, the minute a child is diagnosed, they become transformed into a commodity of the autism industries 
and that child represents nearly boundless potential for profit extraction. So I argue that we don't just need autism acceptance. Yes, we do. <laughs> we need autistic, not, not only acceptance, valuing uh, liberation, pride, right? We need all of that, but we continue to need, I, I argue, autism awareness. We continue to need critical autism awareness, not awareness of signs, symptoms, that sort of thing. Um, we need to develop critical awareness so as to disrupt the industrial scale, excuse me, the industrial scale commodification of autistic people. So the question then is, how do we do that? <laughs> right? What else do we need to raise critical awareness of? How do we disrupt the commodification? Well, I argue that we need concentrated awareness of autism within capitalism. Right? We cannot possibly understand what autism is, what it means, unless we understand what autism does. And everything that it does, it does within capitalism. And frankly, it always has. Okay, and this is the part where I can't actually see you, but I can hear you thinking, what? What is wrong with that woman? Autism has nothing to do with capitalism. Maybe I, you know, have something else I can do instead of watching this webinar. Um, but this is the point where I get to argue that autism has everything to do with capitalism. Please just hear me out. So autism is a concept that barely existed 75 years ago. Um, and it currently feeds multiple multi-billion dollar a year global and globalizing industries. So the question I asked was, how is this possible, right? How did we get here? How did we get from the 11, 11 children first identified by Leo Connor in 1943 as autistic? How do we go from 11 children to the billion dollar global autism industries that are booming today. This is something that I was curious about, right? And no, I know what you're thinking, I can hear you. The answer is not because of the autism epidemic. Um, at least it's not exactly because of the autism epidemic. More on that later, put a pin in it, we will come back to it. We got here, I argue, and, and Robin along with me, because of the autism industrial complex or what we call the AIC. So why this language, why the terminology, why an industrial complex? Well, obviously it's an extrapolation of the military industrial complex, um, which Eisenhower offered us the idea in 1961. So why did Dwight Eisenhower warn the nation against the rising military industrial complex at that time? Um, a couple of things. Number one, he feared the dangerous poten potential for abuse of power. Um, ideological monopoly combined with commercial profiteering is very likely to lead to abuse of power. He warned us against that. He also feared that decisions about military spending would be driven not by the interests of national security, but rather by the interests of the high potential for private and corporate profit. He warned us against that. He also feared that any human costs of military proliferation would be disregarded um, as insignificant in, in the face of the industry's enormous profitability. He warned us about that as well. He was rather appreciative. Um, so the analogous dangers of the autism industrial complex, we assert are, are pretty much exactly the same dangers. Um, we assert that there are significant existing abuses of power right now going on today in association with ideological monopoly and commercial profiteering within the AIC. Uh, we also assert that both public policy and individual decision-making in relation to autism and autistic people are currently driven by and large, not necessarily by the interests of autistic people, but are driven rather by the interests of the private and corporate, corporate profit potential within the AIC. And lastly, in alignment with Eisenhower, we also argue that the human costs of the proliferation of the AIC, which are almost entirely borne by autistic people, um, are widely disregarded as insignificant in the face of the industry's enormous profitability. So this concept of, the, of an industrial complex, the concept of the AIC allows us to understand how the cultural politics of autism and the economy of autism co-create one another, okay? It also allows us to document the ways that the cultural production 
of autism as a social problem and also then the consumption of the idea of autism as a social problem has always been co-produced for consumption with a cultural logic of intervention as the natural response to the problem of autism. Later, the cultural logic of prevention would come into it, okay? And lastly, the concept of the AIC allows us to understand how both the cultural politics and the economy, the political economy of autism have collectively served for over 70 years now to generate, to justify, and to perpetuate the extraction of profit from autism. And to be clear, that means from autistic people within the US's advanced neoliberal capitalist economy, okay? So to return to the military industrial complex, the military industrial complex is not just the businesses, right? It's not just the corporations that profit within the military industry. So the military industrial complex is not just Boeing and Halliburton and Blackwater and all of the, the folks who have the very high dollar military contracts, right? The military industrial complex rather is the set of ideas that we as a nation consumed for decades that made it feel natural and normal and inevitable and to a certain extent invisible that military spending should continue to proliferate, right? So you no longer actually have to make much of a case for military spending. In fact, you actually have to work pretty hard to make a case to reduce military spending. Um, it's just how we do things here in the US. And that is the industrial complex, right? The set of ideas. Um, likewise, the autism industrial complex is actually not all those businesses that make money from autism and make business, excuse me, and make money from autistic people, right? So all of the therapy consultancies, all the all those LLCs, right? The service providers, the specialized legal practices, the research institutes, even the people who charge more money for tagless T-shirts when they get to market them as autism friendly, right? The people with the dolls, all of that they make up the autism industries, okay? Um, that's, the, the, that's the commercial sector. Those are the autism industries, but the autism industries only exist and thrive, <clears throat> excuse me, because of the AIC, the autism industrial complex. So the AIC's foundational products are not the dolls. Um, they're not even the therapies or the services. Um, they're not the fidget spinners, right? The foundational product, products of the AIC are fundamentally ideas. Um, the AIC has been producing ideas for our consumption for decades now. Um, idea number one is that autism is a social problem. Uh, take your pick, metaphor of the month, uh, right? Disease, enemy, child abductor, alien, epidemic, contagious, financial tsunami, albatross, um, caravan, take your pick. Um, that's problem number one or excuse me, idea number one. And secondly, the narrative cultural logic of intervention and later also of prevention, right? Uh, and the establishment and widespread consumption of the idea that autism is a problem both rationalizes and justifies our concomitant acceptance of the second, right? The two go hand in hand. It's kind of a two for one deal. When you establish autism as a problem, you then set up a narrative logic that of course you must intervene to ameliorate that problem, right? And these two ideas, these two sets of ideas have been co-produced, co-constructed, co-constituted, and importantly have been commodified and consumed for decades now. So the AIC, primarily produces and distributes ideas for consumption. And we have been, all of us, consuming them for decades. It doesn't matter if you are not a consumer of autism products or autism services. You may not yourself um, have anything to do with actual autism commerce. Um, and yet, because of mass media, you have been consuming the idea is that A, autism is a problem, and B, intervention is natural, necessary, just, and best, um, simply by living within this, this culture. And that's how the AIC operates. Every person is a potential latent consumer. And if we want to bring you to the point of active consumption within the autism industry, should that become necessary for you, then we need to ensure that you've already consumed and accepted the foundational ideas that autism is a problem and intervention is necessary, 
Okay. Um, so the AIC manufactures its foundational products through the systematic deployment and the really shameless, just shameless rhetorical manipulation of people's cultural hopes and of their cultural fears um, through really, really skillfully deploying both metaphor and narrative, right? There's a lot of media savvy in the AIC manufacturing of its products. Um, and then the, the AIC distributes those uh, rhetorical, ideological, foundational products, those ideas, right, through a wide ranging, sophisticated, multi platform, ubiquitous, and global media campaign. So I argue in the book that the AIC deploys three main sort of sets of rhetorics, right? Um, one is the politics of hope, mostly pulling on, on parents' heartstrings in terms of hope. And by parents, I mean primarily non autistic parents of autistic children. Um, so deploying the politics of hope, um, hope for recovery, hope for recovery from autism. It's a fundamentally ableist hope, um, but it is powerful for a lot of people nonetheless. Um, and hope for a future with no autism or less autism in it, which is, of course, we have to recognize a future with no or at least fewer autistic people in it. So the politics of hope have been deployed for several decades now. Also, the politics of fear, the fear of autism itself, um, autism as an enemy or alien or child abductor, um, but simply also general sort of background, low level anxiety and fear for one's, uh, for one's child's future, right? And in the production of ideas that get circulated through the mass media, um, the, AIC, the AIC produces and distributes ideas like autism is bad, autism is, is tragic. Autism is catastrophic. Autism is terrifying. Autism is coming for your children. And by that, mostly they mean you're presumed to be normal children, your non-autistic children. Um, autistic children have no future. Um, autistic adults are likely to be, or even should be perhaps institutionalized. Autistic people can't possibly lead happy or normal or independent lives. And again, all of these ideas are wrapped into constructing autism fundamentally as a social problem. Uh, so the economic architecture, cultural, political, economic architecture of the AIC also produces for our widespread consumption that second foundational product I talked about, which is the narrative logic that not only is autism dangerous and threatening and generally bad, but also that it therefore necessitates intervention and here's the kicker, some forms of intervention are better and notably better investments than others, okay? So it also produces ideas such as, and we consume ideas such as intervention is our only hope. Um, with the proper intervention, your child might be recovered to normalcy. Um, only one type of intervention is scientific. Only one type of intervention is evidence-based. Only one intervention is cost-effective. All other interventions are hoaxes or fraudulent or pseudoscientific or anti-scientific or ineffective or nonsense or what have you. Autism should be eradicated. Um, autism should be prevented if possible. Uh, the world would be a better place if there were fewer autistic people in it. Autistic people are an economic burden on our society, right? All of these kinds of, uh, of narratives come together uh, to convey the narrative idea that intervention is the natural, normal, appropriate cultural response to the problem of autism and therefore autistic people. So if you remember, I said there were three main rhetorics deployed by the AIC, right? One being the politics of hope, the other being the politics of fear, um, but also and notably, there's also what I call the politics of truth. Uh, which is rhetorically deployed through the discourse and the rhetoric of science, which, by the way, um, is a different thing from science itself. The rhetoric of science, the discourse of science is not necessarily the same thing as science. Okay, so science <laughs> is a suite of methods for systematically studying the physical and actually vastly more difficult task of studying the social world. Okay, it's a, they, it's, a, it's a set of methods of inquiry, methods of systematic inquiry. That is, that is science. However, science is also additionally a discourse. 
It's a vocabulary. It's a set of language rhetoric. Science as a discourse, as rhetoric, lends uh, legitimacy. It lends weight. It lends authority. It lends credibility. Science um, is a the, the discourse of science is the vocabulary of, of truth claims, right? So it also functions as as a, a, a po the politics of truth, okay? So that's science as discourse. And then there's what's called scientism, which again is a different thing. Uh, so Hack described scientists describes scientism as follows. She says, scientism is a kind of over-enthusiastic and uncritically deferential attitude towards science. Um, and an inability to see or an unwillingness to acknowledge its fallibilities, its limitations, and even its potential dangers. So the second passage is a, as a, a passage quoted from my book, because I go one further <laughs> beyond her definition of science, of scientism. I go one further and I argue that sometimes scientism stems not merely from an inability or an unwillingness to acknowledge the limitations and the potential dangers of scientific processes. I argue rather sometimes this uh, stems from a strategic decision to actively deploy the discourse of science to establish, gain, or consolidate economic or political power. And I argue that this particularly is likely to happen when it's in the context of seeking to shape public opinion and or to garner support for one's position on a political or an ideological or a policy or a commercial issue or venture. So Hack gives us these, how do we know scientism when we hear it? How do we know it when we see it, right? She gives us these six signs of scientism. I'm gonna run through it real quick. Uh, she says, we know it might be scientism when, we, the, when the rhetoric, when the discourse is using the words science, scientifically, scientific, scientist, um, excessively and honorifically, just as generic terms of, of epistemic praise, generic terms of value, right? Um, we know it might be scientism when we see a lot of adopting of the manners, the trappings, the technical terminology of the sciences, regardless of whether it's actually useful to the context or not. Um, we also tend to see within scientism a real preoccupation with demarcation, right? A real preoccupation with, with us and them, with drawing a very sharp dividing line between what is genuine or real science um, and so-called pseudoscientific imposters, right? There's a, there's a lot of attention and discussion focused on who's on which side of that line. A corresponding preoccupation with identifying uh, the, often singular, scientific method, even though we know that there are many, many multiple scientific methods, plural. Um, scientism often looks to the sciences exclusively for answers to questions that are actually beyond the scope of science or at least that are only partially addressed by science. Most complex social issues should be informed by scientific understanding, but science alone cannot or does not tell us how to, uh, how to create just public policy. So for example, we may understand the science behind um, the epidemic spread of COVID, for example. Um, however, in order to create public policy, we have to take into account things like, well, who is more likely or less likely to have access to vaccines, yada, yada. There's a lot of uh, cultural, social, economic, and political matters that need to be taken into consideration in coming to a policy position. And lastly, uh, scientism has a tendency to spend a lot of time denying or even denigrating the legitimacy or the worth of any other kinds of inquiry besides the scientific or even besides tiny little narrow slivers of the scientific method, right? One of these scientific methods. Does any of this sound familiar? <laughs> In the context of autism politics, I'm assuming all of this sounds very familiar to you. Um, these data um, are drawn from uh, a wide range of sources. They're, they're listed in the, my book if you're interested, but these data were called in the early to mid 1990s from public sources describing ABA as scientific. That's just a little bit of the vocabulary, right? Uh, ABA uh, appeals to reason, factual information, science-based, time-tested, objective data, highest possible degree of reliability, well-founded, objectively validated. 
um, a corpus of knowledge held together empirically. Voices of reason in the wilderness, the light of scientific objectivity, professional scrutiny, peer review, direct objective observation and measurement of phenomena, standing the test of time, repeated demonstrations called replications, accurate information, evidence, disciplined science, rigorous methodology. Now you've probably all heard all of this in many, 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 many more similar truth claims about ABA as being scientific. Um, I believe yesterday afternoon was the most recent time I personally had um, the, the phrase uh, evidence-based practices deployed against me as a power play. Um, it happens nearly daily to those of us that are involved in the autism politics, right? So the, that's, the, that's the deployment of scientism as a discourse, as a rhetoric to lend legitimacy to a particular, I'm going to say commercial venture, right? Um, the flip side of that, um, this is the language that that same discourse community deploys describing other what they would call non-scientific autism interventions. Again, all of these data are pulled from a variety of public sources from the early to mid nineties. Appeal to emotions, opinion. Other, other autism interventions are based in opinion. Truth is a relative term. These people have the gift of the gab. It's just received wisdom. It's pseudoscience, it's anti-science. It's misinformation, it's false expertise. Um, they're engaged in ferocious ideological warfare. These are unsupported claims. People make claims about curative powers, powers to heal. These are new age gurus. Um, these, this is charlatanism. This is quackery. I'm a little sensitive to those because I've been called a charlatan and a quack by some folks as well. Um, nonsense, scandal, messiahs, moon dust elixir, magic bullets, personal beliefs, social movements, Advo zealots, faith, unproven therapies, ideologues, right? So when you levy these kind of claims against uh, people who are exploring and or advocating for either other kinds of autism interventions and or potentially the absence of intervention as a driving uh, narrative, there's one question that you should be asking yourself when you're bombarded with rhetoric like this over and over and over again for decades, there is one and only one question you need to be asking. And I hope you all know what this is. So what are they selling you, right? <laughs> um, this is a very, very simple, very tried and true um, playbook. It's a, it's a simple marketing playbook. Think back to the last time you were in front of a television and you saw an infomercial, right? If you saw one of those, um, last night I saw one of those infomercials for you know, the pans that you know, all the eggs always stick to. And aren't you tired of your you know, pans that your eggs burn and you stick and you see this poor person trying to scrape eggs out of the pan and it's terrible and it's awful and, the, and it's, in, it's in black and white, right? And the, the person looks just desperately upset and this is terrible and they take the pan and they throw it in the garbage because it's no good and this person has no pans. And then we have these suddenly beautifully lit, brightly colored, um, lovely purple and orange and blue and you know beautiful, beautiful pans that don't stick at all, and they're you know they're for this wonderful price, and you would expect to pay this much money for it, but we're going to give you a really good deal, and you only have to pay that much money for it, right? So you set up. Isn't this terrible? And then wouldn't you like to do something that would be wonderful? We can give you exactly what you want. We can sell you the hope. We can sell you the hope and we can do it for a decent price. And we have legitimacy and four out of five people surveyed love. Yeah, da, 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 da. What are they selling you? Okay. To return to the AIC. Autism commodified. Check. That's done. They took care of that within it, it, the first, they spent nearly 40 years um, commodifying autism. Check, that's done. We are actively consuming it. The unquestioning widespread consumption of the cultural logic of intervention. Check, also done, taken care of. The AIC took care of it. So first came systems of ideas, ideology. 
And then came consistent, pervasive, repeated over and over and over again, rhetorical deployment of those ideas. All that's in place. Um, perhaps, perhaps it's time now to scale up. So Heiliger and Yugo say that autism is a profoundly rhetorical phenomenon, and I would agree with that claim. It absolutely is. However, I spent a number of years analyzing the rhetorics of autism, just looking um, mostly from within the discipline of rhetoric. Um, however, I've now sort of expanded a layer beyond rhetoric because when rhetoric is deployed in service of building a market, uh, when rhetoric is deployed in service of manufacturing consumers, when it's deployed to mass produce consumer confidence in whatever it is you happen to be selling and thereby working to corner that market, um, we reach the point where rhetoric becomes a different thing. Autism may be profoundly rhetorical and it is, but rhetoric that does all of these things this is not just rhetoric, and these are not just ideas. This is branding, okay? And branding is rhetoric in service of capital, okay? And this is branding and marketing, the skillful deployment of rhetoric in service of capital. So the ARC, we, we, we feel surrounded by it, right? Um, but it hasn't always been there. Um, it was built, it was conjured, it was created, it was manufactured produced literally out of ideologies, out of rhetorics, out of branding initiatives, um, out of business plans, out of policy lobbying and media sat saturation and capital investment, and never ever forget it was built out of the bodies of autistic people who form the foundational commodities of the AIC. Nevertheless, it's, it's there now, it's built, it's there, it exists around it, we exist within it. And within the AIC, almost anyone can now capitalize on and profit from autism, and they are doing so in droves. Because it's not just autism that has been commodified, it is also, and much more perniciously, actually autistic people. So from this perspective, from an economic analysis of the AIC, the central problem from this perspective is actually less behaviorism than it is capitalism, right? A lot of people um, hear this work when I talk about it, read what I've written about it, and think that I'm, that I'm just talking about behaviorism, that this is purely about behaviorism. Um, and it's actually not, because even if you were to remove behavior, behaviorism from the mix, as if you could right now, um, you would still have autism and capitalism, right? Um, and so there was a historical moment um, when, you know, behaviorism was ascended at just the right time. Um, and if we had, if things had played out a little bit differently, you know, a few decades earlier, we may have had Freudian psychology form the foundational ideology behind the autism industrial complex. Um, three or four decades later, we may have had brain-based neuroscience that formed the foundational ideology behind the AIC. As it was, we ended up with behaviorism as the found, founding ideology. Um, so it, it, our central problem here continues primarily to be capitalism or more specifically, the commodification of autism and the commodification of autistic people within capitalism. So capitalism, I argue, is hegemonic. So what, is, what does that mean? Um, it means that it's so dominant, it's so pervasive, we actually don't even notice that it's there, right? Um, when our economic conditions, in this case, the capitalist economic conditions that we live in feel so inevitable and so natural and so invisible, we don't even think about them. They feel natural, they, we, don't, we can't imagine a time when they ever weren't there, and therefore we probably can't imagine a time in which they might be different. Um, but they're not natural, they were created by, by us, by humans. Um, and I argue that trying to get Americans specifically, frankly, other folks who are um, outside the US are usually more open <laughs> to thinking and talking about capitalism um, somewhat critically, but trying to get Americans specifically to think critically about capitalism is a little bit like trying to get a fish to think critically about water. And it is next to impossible to get a fish to think about land 
right? To get outside of the water that they live in and think about the land. And by the way, you can't get a fish to think about water either. It's just the universe that exists, right? Similarly with Americans and capitalism, right? So I told you we would come back to it. I said, put a pin in it. Let's revisit the concept of the autism epidemic, shall we? Okay, so uh, Grinker argues that this particular diagnosis, autism, uh, became embedded in a financial system that has come to depend on that diagnosis for its sustainability and growth. And further building on hacking, um, Grinker argues that once a diagnostic label such as autism becomes a fulcrum around which institutionalized financial activities coalesce, that is once an industrial complex is formed, that very diagnostic category provides an incentive for manufacturing people with the diagnosis whose presence and needs support that financial infrastructure. So viewed through the lens of capital, right, rather than rhetoric or rather than science or rather than anything else, viewed through the lens of capital, what does the concept of an autism epidemic actually do, right? Let's go back to that claim. So the metaphor, and it is a metaphor, the metaphor epidemic accomplishes at least two significant things. Uh, number one, it constitutes autism as a disease and therefore a medical matter, right? But secondly, it generates a strong sense of threat, a strong sense of urgency of cultural fear. So the question then we need to ask is why was it beneficial and to whom? to constitute autism as disease and therefore a medical matter, despite fairly strong activist opposition to doing so, we need to ask what it does. Remember I said in order to understand autism, we need to not only ask what it is, but also what it does during, in, within capitalism. So what does an epidemic, the metaphor of an epidemic do? What does it accomplish within capitalism? Well, the answer to that is it fairly successfully targeted and established a revenue stream for the autism industries. So again, revenue stream for what and for whom? Sorry, I, I uh, went ahead. In this case, it's a revenue stream for behavioral intervention for autism primarily um, and people who profit from that industry. So again, I repeat, behaviorism is actually not the central problem here because within neoliberal capitalism in the US, post-war, the second half of the 20th century, given the economic and cultural trajectory of the US, um, autism couldn't possibly not have been commodified within those economic conditions, right? Um, behaviorism happened to be in the right place at the right time. Um, and to give credit where credit is due, it turns out behaviorists are very good capitalists by and large, so, you know, call out for that. So behaviorism has been the central driving vehicle of the commodification of autism for nearly 80 years, okay? Now remember, let's go back to the epidemic thing. The AIC worked for decades to produce autism as a social problem and also the cultural logic of behavioral intervention in tandem with one another. So if autism is a disease, if we cast it as an epidemic, if that's a disease, which is a specific kind of problem, um, then the nature of that intervention should be logically, or at least commercially, connected to that kind of problem somehow. Um, spoiler, they kind of abandoned the logical part and settled for commercially connected. So autism as a disease, epidemic disease, enabled the accomplishment of two things. Number one, the co-constitution of a particular intervention for autism, in this case, behavioral intervention, applied behavior analysis, ABA, um, as a medically necessary intervention for autism. Calling autism an epidemic disease, constituting it as a disease, created the necessary cultural, bureaucratic, and legislative contexts to regard or at least to um, to establish, to rhetorically establish ABA as a medically necessary intervention for autism. Okay, so this didn't happen by magic. Uh, between 2007 and 2019, the behavioral intervention industry 
along with its main nonprofit corporations, Autism Speaks and the Behavior Analyst Certification Board, collectively lobbied to pass boilerplate legislation in all 50 US states, declaring ABA to be medically necessary intervention for autism and thereby requiring health insurance to fund it to the exclusion of most other interventions. Remember, I asked what does epidemic disease accomplish rhetorically? Well, this is its accomplishment. You can't argue that something is medically necessary unless you've already established it as being a medical matter, a medical disease, right? And so it had a, a significant commercial impact. Autism as uh, epidemic disease also enabled the accomplishment of the establishment, this is by the um, AMA, the American Medical Association, of permanent medical billing codes for ABA intervention for autism, which essentially simply bureaucratically streamlined the revenue flows to make everything flow much more quickly, efficiently, easily um, into uh, behavioral consultancies. Also, not by magic. This was through active uh, lobbying, bureaucratic, organizational work of Autism Speaks, the ABAI, and the BACB also helped. Okay. So all that is, a, is related to medical, right? That's, you know, if you're going to call it a disease, we've got those two accomplishments. Uh, we've established ABA to be medically necessary. We've made it very easy to bill ABA. Um, but why epidemic disease, right? Why not just disease? We've now unfortunately all seen before our own eyes um, what epidemic and even pandemic spread looks like. Um, autism is most definitely not that. Um, why did they use this very hyperbolic epidemic metaphor? I said that it accomplished two things. It constituted autism as a disease and therefore a medical matter, which we just talked about. But it secondly, additionally, generated a very strong sense of threat, urgency, or cultural fear. Epidemic ups, ups the stakes. It creates more urgency, it creates more fear, okay? Um, and all of these rhetorics that the AOC deploys, um, I say, you know, hope, hope may inspire us to take particular action. Science might persuade us to take others. Um, but fear, fear is a discourse, fear mobilizes funding. Okay, again, this is tried and true playbook, okay? There is no way that you successfully push through boilerplate legislation in all 50 US states in just 12 years without a substantial amount of cultural fear mongering driving it, and incidentally also a fair amount of big money funding it. So two other points that we'll consider about the so-called autism epidemic, or what I prefer to call the diagnostic subsector at work. Uh, first is that changes to the diagnostic criteria for autism could not have more successfully created the appearance of an autism epidemic if they had tried. And I'm actually kind of pretty sure they tried. Um, secondly, so-called autism clusters tend to be centered not around, you know, they're not around Superfund sites, they're not around any environmental toxins, but rather they tend to be clustered around commercial centers of the diagnostic and intervention industries, right? Where are the main clusters of autism in the US? They are in California, Massachusetts, and New Jersey, right? What on earth is the legacy in, in California? We've got UCLA, we've got Ibar Lobos, we've got the Young Autism Project was going on decades earlier locally to UCLA than it was going on around the rest of the country. Massachusetts has the commercial and diagnostic legacies there of Skinner. Exact same thing, the commercial architecture is there. New Jersey, we have Rutgers and others, <laughs> and we have a very strong, um, and very prolific um, for-profit um, set of autism intervention services in New Jersey. Okay, so to revisit the question that I started with. So how did we get, how did we get from the 11 children, 11, first identified by Leo Connor in 1943 as autistic to the billion dollar autism industries that are booming today? We got here, via the 20th century labors and the ongoing 21st century labors of the AIC. So here's a very quick timeline to illustrate. Okay, 1943, Leo Connor identified autism in the US. 
1952, the second edition of the DSM included autism as a psychiatric diagnosis. Putting it in as a psychiatric diagnosis placed it squarely within the purview of child psychiatrists to diagnose autism. Primarily, that diagnosis was only applied to children who were already in living in institutional settings and under the care of a child psychiatrist. Okay, 1980, the revision, the DSM-3, autism was reclassified not as a psychiatric disorder, but rather as a developmental disorder. What impact did that have? Well, now diagnostic, the diagnostic gaze, if you will, is now within the purview of pediatricians not just child psychiatrists working in institutional settings. Now we're bringing into the diagnostic dragnet, we're bringing pediatricians, right? So every child is going for well child visits. We're gonna have a lot more people having their eyes on, going through checklists, classifying um, kids as autistic. 1987, uh, the DSM-3R broadened the, diagnos the diagnostic criteria for autism, right? They added, for example, the catch-all cat category of pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified. That one was important because it enabled the diagnosis of kids who um, we first sort of looked at and started wondering about and evaluating um, over the age of 30 months, right? The previous autism diagnosis, all of this had to be in place before the child was 30 months of age. So that broadened it again, probably more kids are gonna get caught in that diagnostic gaze. 1990. We added autism as a category of eligibility to federal special education law, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, right? So now our diagnostic gaze is expanded further. It now includes educators and also parents, knowing this is a category of eligibility my kid might be eligible for. You might wanna have your kid evaluated. We might wanna send them to the school-based child psycho psychologist, okay? We're adding more people to the, to participate, to actively participate in the diagnostic gaze. 1994, it gets broadened again. The DSM-4 established autism spectrum disorder, which by the way, appeared to be a sort of a test balloon uh, because we now have things like um, depressive disorders and schizophrenia and others are now using this uh, spectrum conceptualization apparently successfully, right? Um, and then in 2013, the DSM-5 tidied up a few things, removed Asperger's, et cetera. And the changes that came out um, last month are really not having much impact on this conversation. Okay. So in the first 70 years of the existence of autism as an idea, as a concept, as a thing, the diagnostic criteria and the professionals, in, professionals involved in diagnostic processes were broadened or expanded no fewer than five or six, depending on how you want to count it, but let's say no fewer than five times. I don't call that an epidemic. I call that manufacturing a market. And this is the point at which I can hear you thinking, oh, I, can, I can't see you, but if I could see you, I could see your little eyes rolling in your head. Oh, Alicia, people always tell me this. Oh, Alicia, you're so cynical. Not everything is about capitalism. Perhaps not, um, but you don't need to take my word for it. Why don't we ask the capitalists? And spoiler, the capitalists clearly think that autism is about capitalism, even if you do not. Market research firms are, well, all of them, are projecting really bullish forecasts for the autism markets globally over the next decade, especially for the ABA and pharmaceutical markets you might wanna tell your broker. Private equity and venture capital firms are acquiring and consolidating as many autism related assets as they can get their hands on because high demand plus low supply, we all know this marketing 101, high potential for profit. And also let's not forget that these industries are largely un or under regulated right now. So the time to invest is now when the potential for profit extraction is at its highest before we get a lot of pesky regulations in there. And then there's the Autism Investor Summit. No, I am not making this up. I could not possibly make this up. Really? Here we go. It's coming up in, in, in April, in less than three weeks. Um, it's in Beverly Hills. Of course, it's in Beverly Hills. 
Um, it's an exclusive curated by that they mean they won't let people like me in um, meet and greet conference that puts LLC owners selling autism interventions in direct conversation with private equity firms, uh, venture capitalists and other potential investors and consolidators. By the way, 2022 marks the fourth annual autism investor summit. So the capitalists know it's about capitalism. And the behaviorists know it's about capitalism and they're actually really kind of good at it. So this is a, this is a book put out by, um, by some behaviorists about how to build a seven figure ABA firm. Clearly there's a little bit of being in it for the, you know, for the money part. By the way, the back of this book, I'm not gonna subject you to it. Um, I believe it is self-published and there are enough typos on the back of the book that make me a little bit afraid of the interior of the book. Um, some of the behaviors are actually a little bit of cranky, a little bit cranky um, about their autism LLCs being commodified by private equity. It's a little bit ironic. So what are they talking about at the Autism Investor Summit, for example? Are they talking at these meetings about what's best or what's ethical or what's scientific or what's right or what's just for, let alone desired by, autistic people? No. They're talking about which business decisions have the potential to extract the highest profits, period. So who's invited to the Autism Investor Summit? It's, as I said, it's curated. I don't get to go. Um, who is invited? Stakeholders are invited. You know, stakeholders. Autism Intervention LLC business owners, ABA business owners, right? Um, investment bankers, they're stakeholders. Venture capitalists, legislators, they're regarded as stakeholders, not autistic people. Commodities are not stakeholders, okay? I say, and just in case you're one of those people who's thinking, oh, what are you talking about? We have to crash it, nothing about us without us. Why aren't they listening to the voices of autistic people? I love you and I appreciate you. I really, really do. But asking that question is a little bit like asking why the chickens and the soybeans don't get invited to similar kinds of things that put little family farms in touch with big corporate ag when they're doing um, similar, you know, buying up, scaling up private equity, venture capital investment, right? The commodities don't get a seat at the table. So these stakeholders, they get together and these are the things that they talk about. All of these phrases and, and bits of language I pulled from their program. They talk about mergers and acquisitions and deals and buyers and sellers and consolidation and market considerations and payer landscapes and value-based reimbursement and revenue cycle management and private equity and apparently something called humology, which I didn't get, I had to look it up. It's probably not that important. All right, those of you who thought I was just a lunatic cynic, anybody still think this has nothing to do with capitalism? So to go back to my original framing, um, thinking about April, <laughs> uh, what are we gonna do with April? Um, awareness, autism awareness isn't inherently negative, right? But we have to ask awareness of what? Um, I argue that greater awareness of the commodification of autistic people would actually be a good thing if that awareness can lead to a disruption of those processes, okay? Um, and autism acceptance, by the way, all by itself, isn't necessarily inherently positive if it's used as a shiny object to groom consumption and to groom brand loyalty and to distract from asking the hard questions and to shield from view the ongoing commodification of autistic people. So this isn't a simple binary consideration. We can't just say autism awareness bad, autism acceptance good. We should always ask, not just every April, who benefits? The booming autism industries ultimately may or may not improve the lives of autistic people, uh, but they certainly seem to be benefiting the many, many non-autistic people that profit from their existence. Uh, thank you, thank you very, very much for your time. That's the title of my book and the QR code is just a, a link to the publisher site, which lists a much, uh, which lists a detailed, um, table of contents 
because this presentation was just a teeny tiny little snippet of the overall analysis. So if you're interested in seeing what some of the additional analysis is, um, you can find it there. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Alicia. Okay, you can stop sharing. Um, Liz will come on in a second. We're about to post the link for the book giveaway. Um, and as I said, they will be first come first serve just so everybody knows we'll do our best. Um, okay, so first of all, thank you so much. This, this topic obviously opens a ton of um, potential topics that we could <laughs> explore more. Like stick, poking a stick in a beehive and swirling it around a little bit. Yeah, just a little. Um, maybe first, Liz, I'll give it to you to uh, let you comment. <laughs> well, um, I tell you, when I uh, read the, the manuscript, the book, um, it was uh, very eye-opening and I learned quite a bit. Um, I, I thought in, in listening to you today, and, and thank you for, for a wonderful uh, scholarly um, presentation and uh, education. Um, I, I have many questions and I don't know where to start. Uh, the, the first thing that occurred to me was, um, what if every autistic person out there this drops the label and said, I'm just part of the human spectrum? What, how would we, how could we do that? I mean, we are all part of the human spectrum. This is, this is nonetheless created an identity that is now difficult to, um, you can't deny it, but it's it's done so um, as you very eloquently um, established uh, through all this uh, rhetoric and and marketing plot. Um, but it it has missed an opportunity, uh, in my opinion, to um, unify us all as as a society to help each other. And I tell you as a scientist and uh, a researcher who doubts her work all the time, and that's how we operate. We always- As, as scientists do, scientists play, doubt their own work, yes. We play devil's advocate uh, all the time. What if, what if, and we uh, challenge ourselves. That's how we do science. Mm -hmm. And we highlight the errors and, and then move forward, uh, trying to address those errors and the caveats. And, and, and so when I, when I read your book and, and so, um, and felt that science was used and misused in the way that it has been, um, I feel really terrible about that because uh, we're, we're suffering the consequences. And I tell you, I don't come from the, autism field per se. I come from a different field and that's why I'm so shocked to see this um, in autism. Uh, the lack of multidisciplinary collaboration, the lack of transparency and uh, with the errors that we make in our inquiries and the lack of openness and so forth. Um, and the circularity of it all that I keep saying, well, of course you already pre-labeled everything you're doing. What are you talking about? There's no self-emerging phenomena here that you can you know, say or spontaneously, okay, this is what it is and explains X or Y. Uh, so it's all very prescribed. And um, it, it, you know, I just wonder how, how we could as a community, as a collective regain that opportunity, how could we work together uh, to regain that opportunity of collaborative, positive work? Because I see this as a divider. Um, we, we are amidst a war zone here. Uh, we are at Rutgers. Rutgers is 
uh, autism, um, from ABA, uh, behaviorism, uh, panacea. We are uh, <laughs> stick in the in the in the heart of the whole thing. And I do want to collaborate. I do want to establish a path of communication that is driven by the autistic community uh, to change all of this. And, and just one last thing before I, I hand it to you and the, and the rest of the public or the audience. Um, I do disagree a little bit with the last bit of uh, when you put out that wonderful timeline of the DSM that is so illuminating. Uh, that last change actually. The most recent one? The most recent one, I think is going, it's already having an impact. Do you? Okay. No, I, I know this for a fact. And we, uh, we surveyed the, the BCBAs, they surveyed themselves, they came to us. Because here's the problem that this epidemic thing created for them, right? You have the, the ABA of the school system, which is given for granted. And who would want to change any, any of that? They already they get their, their coverage and what have you. It's imposed, it's, every, it's, it's, it's pervasive, it's everywhere. There's no escape from that. But here's the pri private practitioner's conundrum. That sensory inclusion of sensory issues open up a floodgate of people from all walks of life that were not before part of that diagnosis. And in addition to that, the inclusion of ADHD, which was in the DSM-4, not allowed to be comorbid with autism, it was a diagnosis in, in, in itself, now is allowed to be comorbid Obviously, then you can prescribe more medication to more people, right? So, uh, you know, that poses a problem because along with ADHD, come OCD, Tourette's, um, all, all a host of all uh, uh, issues that have motor issues. So now you have sensory and motor, which are the two things they have denied. They have they ignored, yeah. yeah, that this doesn't exist. There's no issues there. Okay, and now you have another issue that is they have this campaign of early detection for early intervention. Mm -hmm. Never mind that there's no proper intervention, and they shouldn't be because you shouldn't insult a nascent nervous system the way that is being done. But never mind. Now you get toddlers being diagnosed that people who got it an ABA certification of any kind, whether it's a D or the non-D or the para, uh, paraprofessional or whatever, BT or whatever, does not have any knowledge whatsoever to deal with toddlers. True. Yeah. So what is happening is that many of these folks who have a big heart, they're not just for yes. the money. Some, I tell you, I have met BCBAs that really, I want to work with them and do something to flip this around. But those are the ones that have, are coming to me and saying, Liz, I'm becoming now certified on developmental models on other alternatives because we don't get what we, what we need to cope with the influx of new people that this change in the DSM criteria created. So in that regard, <laughs> I think that within that world, already there is friction that right. will lead to change. And I, I'm seeing it. We actually surveyed it, not only in New Jersey, but across the US. And 80%, and 80% of the people that we surveyed, 180 in each category of, of you know, New Jersey and, and, and the states, um, want a change. Okay. And, and one collaboration mm -hmm. and one uh, uh, neuroscience infused uh, and, and neurology and, and uh, wearable sensing technology that enables them to measure physical discomfort and so forth. So anyhow, so two, the two questions are one, what do you think in a hypothetical situation would happen if uh, people 
walk out and say, okay, here's, I hand you my autism label. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm gonna start over. I'm just part of the human spectrum, deal with it. And secondly, how do you think we could collaborate? How, how do you, if, if you had like, a, if you could travel in time, back in time, how would you have done this differently to get to a different point today where we could collaborate with each other? Those are my two questions. And thank you again for your very who's, illuminating. Who's, who's the we, Liz, in your, so we could collaborate? Who's the, the we? Entire, in the entire community, the self-advocacy, <clears throat> the researchers, uh, the people that are profiting now and need to understand that this is, this is, uh, unfair to many and to themselves, even though they don't see it that way, uh, because they're really uh, uh, stopping progress. Um, so just everybody in the um, ecosystem, that in the ecosystem of autism. So I've thought about this <laughs> and people have asked, you know, so, okay, so how do we, how do we dismantle the AIC? And to me, the short answer is we don't um, because I can't see dismantling capitalism anytime soon, right? I, it's, science is conducted within capitalism, right? All of the, you know, all of the, the, the grants and the, the, everything that we do is within the constraints of a capitalist economy. And so to your question about, you know, what would happen if everybody just, you know, refused the labeling, da, 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 da. what I talk about in the book is we say that, you know, there's no sort of grand redemptive path here. There's no dismantling. There's no tearing it down and building something new. Um, I think the reality is much messier than that, which is we talk about working in the interstices, right? In the spaces that are left between working in the, uh, in the ruins in a way, in the detritus of capitalism, right? And there are different pockets and different spaces and different people are able to do different kinds of work depending upon their own positionality, right? So one of the things that we do say in the book is we honor the kids, for example, who are incarcerated in spaces, in schools and in clinics and in institutions, right? Where they are being restrained, where they are being secluded, where they may be experiencing chemical restraints and other kinds of things. Um, the kids who bite the teacher, Right, and we, we say really clearly, you know what? If this child is resisting these biopolitical technologies of control upon their body with the only instrument available to them, which is literally their body and their teeth and their fingernails, we honor that resistance, even though that resistance may not even happen with the luxury of knowing that there's other people resisting this that there's other people trying to sort of, you know, get you out of the situation, other people having your back. That is a very immediate in the, in the present, in the moment, in very intimate personal space kind of resistance, right? Um, there's other kinds of resistances, right? There's organized resistance in terms of like civil rights, political rights. We have, you know, we have ASAN doing a ton of really, really good policy work, working within the instruments of a neoliberal legislative state, right? We've got, we've got these instruments of here's how we lobby policymakers. By the way, today's the last day. Please go on uh, to the IACC and submit your public comment about what you want to be your priorities for autism research funding dollars to go to, right? There are those mechanisms that we can and should be deploying whenever we can, whenever we are capable. And to your question, there's already people doing that, Liz. There are already people who have the, the, uh, the ability and the privilege to be able to do it. I call that living um, off grid or living in stealth mode. There are people who choose uh, not to um, choose either not to disclose their diagnosis or choose not to engage in diagnostic processes, right? Um, and who live sort of off grid, right? Who find a, a niche employment opportunity that works well with their autistic strengths and that doesn't require certain uh, compromises be made 
the question becomes, to what extent do you um, need or value or desire supports? And if you need or value or desire supports, the diagnostic process, as you know, is your ticket to it. It is a, it is a necessary ticket to accessing those services unless you are independently wealthy and can privately pay. That's simply how our how our system is 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 set up, right? And we do continue to we you know we've got public school dollars and then we've got health insurance dollars, right? Those are the two sort of major funding streams that can support uh, various kinds of therapies. In my mind, it's not that I see any dismantling of it. I really I really don't necessarily see that. But what I am trying to pursue is. Um, let's look it in the face. Let's, and I recognize the irony of that uh, metaphor, by the way. Um, look me in the eyes, right? Um, we need to recognize that what is happening here is at many, many, many levels driven by capital. Okay, so when somebody says, you know, this is best for your child, I have only your best interests at heart. I have absolute confidence that the individual clinician saying that does in fact probably have your child's best interest at heart or your best interest at heart. But that's also not the only interest that that person has. And that's not the only interest that that person's employers have, right? And so I think that reckoning with the uh, commercial infrastructure and reckoning with the economics of it at a, at a minimum should enable people to ask different sets of questions, right? Um, and you know, and I think that I think that asking different sets of questions can be empowering. I don't see a grand a grand dismantling, but I do see um, I do see increasingly uh, a refusal of diagnosis. Um, I also see a certain embrace of non-binarism. Right, we have this very, very binary concept of autistic and non-autistic, right? Um, autistic and holistic, and you know, do you have a diagnosis? You know, do you not? Um, and there's, I think, something to be said for um, beginning to interrogate the binarism of that particular construct as well. Um, and as far as working, working with one another, again, I think that a, it's a messy business. And I think each of us does it every day in our own way. Um, you know, I, 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 I wish I knew, I wish I could, you know, wave the magic wand. But I think I, the one thing I do know is that um, I've gotten to the point of refusing to involve myself in initiatives that do not center um, the active participation of autistic people, speaking and non-speaking, right? So when I get, you know, invitations to do this or to do that or to do the other, always my first question is, well, who, um, who are the autistic people that you've involved in the design of this project? And usually then they say, oh, we need to get some, <laughs> right? Um, and so to me, I, you know, in terms of where energies are best spent, I tend to um, really, really gravitate toward initiatives that involve autistic people centrally, not as an afterthought for the sake of branding. So you can say, oh, look, we have this autistic person over here. It's our token person. We asked to come to our meetings, right? And you guys at the center have just done this amazing job of really foregrounding and really, really giving a platform to um, autistic agendas. And you know that to me is a huge, huge launching point. I, I don't know if it's that people who fail to include autistic people in their research agendas, in their, you know, all their other things, does it really not occur to them that maybe they should? Or, you know, I, I go back and forth on that question as to whether it's sort of active exclusion because that would be inconvenient. Yeah right, versus really a level of kind of ignorance that's somewhat shocking. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's probably a combination of the two, honestly. And, um, you know, for many people, I and mean, you've both talked about this, you know, Liz uh, has that Upton Sinclair quote on some of her research articles. And it's, you know, if, if paychecks are tied, 
to delivering certain services that are not in the best interest of autistic people, then there is going to be an inability to, you know, change anything. And something that I wanted to bring up, um, and we will get to your questions, uh, just so everyone knows, I'm going to try my best. I just, I really want to get to two points first. Um, in talking about like the point that you made about how fear gets funding is, I mean, it's so true. And that happens both on a macro level in terms of the epidemic. Um, and then also in terms of a micro level. Um, so like on the macro level, you know, we hear about uh, the financial tsunami, as you mentioned, and, you know, organizations talk about the cost of autism and then you see the rates you know, so there's all of this monitoring going on of like, oh, we have no idea why the rates have changed so much. So we have to put all this money into this particular sector. And then on a micro level, parents are almost coerced yes. by the narrative to spending, I don't know how much money, but I know Perfect I've read your house. Yeah. Yes, bankrupting themselves, putting second mortgages on their homes, you know, spending every dollar they have 40 hours a week or whatever it is, whatever the service is, in service of essentially saving their child because that's been the narrative. So I just wondered if you would both, for those who are watching, Liz, because I know that this is your thing too with your research. Um, what, so what are your suggestions to families? Because we know that there is this fear-based narrative um, and autism is not an epidemic. Yeah. You've, you've both, you know, explored this through your research in different ways. Um, but also like, and I feel like I'm missing the essence of my question now, <laughs> Um, I, I just like, how do these factors play a role? Because the cost that is being sold to us and that is then being put onto families is actually just happening because of the narrative of the AIC, as opposed to what is actually ethically, perhaps medically appropriate for an autistic child. Right. And so a couple of points. Number one, that the whole narrative about the high cost, right? It was billions of dollars. You know, this child's going to cost millions of dollars in their lifetime. That gets trotted out to, again, just like the epidemic, the urgency that, that functions to establish urgency. But look, by the same token, let's be perfectly clear. Um, the flip side of cost, cost is only cost if you're paying it. The flip side of this astronomically high cost is revenue, mm. right? And so if we know that there's this astronomically high, you know, cost for all these, that's, that's from the, from the, you know, vendor side, that's great news because we've got a steady stream of dollars coming in. Right. Um, and, and yeah, parents are, the parents get, who wouldn't, who wouldn't be, be frightened if, you know, if you're being told all these horrible, horrible stories about, you know, your child, you know, having no life and you'll, you know, never be able to, you know, hug them and they'll never say, you know, we, they, all of this fear gets sort of ginned up. And I, and parents are in a really, very, really, very difficult position because many, many, many parents of autistic people are themselves non-autistic. And so you're at a bit of a disadvantage, right? Um, and I do this in my teacher ed work as a professor. Um, in schools, we spend a lot of time talking with, um, you know, people who are becoming to be, who are preparing to be teachers of students with disabilities, right? We spend a lot of time teaching them to build relationships with families and with parents and understand the parent perspective and yada, yada, yada. Well, I believe that the exclusive emphasis on that also fuels problems and, and specifically in terms of, of autism, right? I also make my students engage with autistic adults. And I say, okay, so the parents of autistic people who may be non-autistic parents of autistic people um, may themselves be dealing a little bit with some of their own internalized ableism about not wanting to have necessarily a disabled child, mm -hmm. right? Um, and 
And so, you know, I believe we have an obligation to support families through that. And one of the mechanisms for doing that is involving autistic adults, right, as, as allies and as, as resources, um, not only for teachers, but for families. And I, I, it's very analogous to um, thinking, I, I, th I find it very analogous to thinking about um, queer kids, right? So if you're a, you know, a, a cisgendered uh, heterosexual parent and you have a kid that you presumed to be cisgendered and heterosexual, and then when they're 10 or 11 or 12 or 15, um, they come out as queer, they come out as non-binary, they come out as gay, you know, then as a parent, you're like, oh, this isn't the child I thought I had. Oh, okay, there's an adjustment. Da, 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 da. And usually there's a welcoming embrace of connecting your kid with queer culture, right? Because, you know, most cisgendered heteronormative parents parents aren't going to consider themselves the experts on being a queer adolescent, right? Whereas in autism politics, there's this, there's this somewhat insularity about, um, you know, being the parent of, a, of an autistic person as being like the um, sort of the ultimate sort of, you know, credibility in terms of knowing about the experience, right? And I think what we need to do is connect non-autistic parents of autistic people with other adult autistic people <laughs> um, to be able to connect them. And I think I may have lost the thread of your question and for that, I apologize. No, it's okay. Um, hopefully my internet is okay. Uh, so just going back to it was um, essentially how like even the parents end up being like you've, you said this in your book, both the parents and autistic people actually sort of become, you know, part of this system. Yeah. Under the parents get groomed as consumers of autism intervention on behalf of their child. Yeah. Right. But, um, but, but I'd like to circle back to the issue of um, the quote unquote epidemic and the cost, right? Because, from, and I'm going to speak from the standpoint of a, of a, of a researcher that um, I, I saw such a heterogeneity in the population that came to my lab. Uh, and I said, this cannot possibly, you know, so I, I had to study other neurological conditions. I had to study other, other issues with the nervous system. And the homogeneity in those conditions was lost in autism. It was like each child was completely different. And I could, I would get children with cerebral palsy, dystonia, uh, OCD, Tourette's, um, all called autistic. I would get children uh, with fragile X mutation, full mutation, pre-mutation carrier. It's Chang 3 deletion syndrome, Timothy syndrome. And what started to worry me was that all having this uh, label of autism were being put through the same kind of one size fits all model uh, therapeutic intervention without regards to the dangers that this would pose for their heart. Uh, this, in some of these. Uh, disorders of genetic origins, the heart can stop, period. Um, for uh, the, the dysregulation of their nervous system, which um, responds with a lot of stress and anxiety because of just the nature of how things, uh, how they perceive the world and so forth. And all of these children and adolescents were called autistic. One word summarizing this huge number of heterogeneous conditions that I, I could not believe my eyes. And in um, any kind of grant that I would have to apply for, I would have to include necessarily a diagnostician and funding for that. Uh, even, if they, even if they brought their diagnosis with them, and sometimes, because it's difficult to find 
uh, families to actually come to the to the research. Uh, years ago, now I, I found ways word of mouth. My research is very well known out there among the families, and we just work as a community. But when I started, when I first started, there was no. For example, in Parkinson's disease, there are support groups for the caregivers. So if I wanted to do research on, on something, like say uh, facial expressions during episodes or whatever, I go to the support group where the caregivers are and they get respite and, and so forth. And they know a lot about this, uh, what to expect and so on. And they cope with each other and they talk to each other. And they, so that's why it's a support group. And I would go there with my flyers and say, I'm about to do this and um, this is my lab and so forth. I would get uh, patients to come to the lab in, in the span of two weeks, I'm done with my number of people that I need. If more wanted to come, perfect, we'll do more. In autism, I couldn't find this. It's like the families were high, you know, even though we have in New Jersey this high prevalence, right? I could not believe it, right? No, nowhere to be seen. Who, where do I talk to people? What, well, all organizations, these nonprofits, there, there are approximately 3,000 of them in New Jersey, by the way, active, but they report to the IRS, they're active. And it's public uh, domain uh, knowledge. They would not help you. They simply would not help you as a researcher. And so um, it, it became to change, you know, it, it, it started to change when my research got well known and we were measuring, you know, things like heart rate variability and motor noise and EEG patterns and things like that. And parents started flooding into the lab and asking us for like a profile of their child. And this was something that I started advocating. Let's profile the physiology of the child and give the parents this as an empowering tool to take to the clinicians that will not do this for them. They need to know the dangers of putting their child under on on stress. And, and this was a way to kind of go around the whole um, AIC that, that it, it was really killing our ability to do research. And by the way, I am persona non grata in places like Simon's Foundation, Autism Speaks, and all those uh, the other autism science, totally persona non grata. Okay, we and Jen and I experienced them. We were asked to leave the, the Simons uh, Foundation venue at New York, uh, New York City. Uh, you know, very politely, but it's time to go. Yeah. So you know, this kind of attitude um, is, is very pervasive and is counterproductive to research and people who do actual rigorous research. Um, luckily, we've overcome that because the families, we work with the families. Uh, but this is precisely why the center is so different. Um, the first thing I did was to find a program manager that was a family that knew the, the issues. I don't know these issues, just like I don't know many other areas of research. So I collaborate with people who are experts on those areas. That's the, that's the spirit. And I am hoping, and, and, and there are other parents in our organization, by the way, and other people who work uh, behind the scenes that are either autistic or, or families, or we're all um, kind of going through like a timeline. What are the needs before the diagnosis? What are the needs after the diagnosis in elementary school? What are the needs in middle school? What are the needs in high school? What about when you become a young adult? So we're learning from the families day to day. Uh, and that's how we're doing it differently. And I'm hoping that this becomes some model for other places. Right. But it hasn't been an easy path, okay? No. Far from it. And, there's, and it's all very centered on you know, the diagnostic process, right? As you point out, right? And by the way, all of those kids that, you know, have other, you know, labels of CP and other things, you know, and within schools and autism label is a ticket to service, right? You get higher levels of service with an autism label than you do with others, right? That's purely an economic ticket thing. But one of the things I do in the book is look at, I compare, for example, I look at the CDC web pages and how our, you know, sort of public health posture is 
toward autistic people as opposed to our public health posture policy-wise uh, toward uh, queer and trans kids, right? Because the numbers are virtually identical, right? Yeah. One in 54 and one in 55, right? Um, and arguably, you know, there are many, many more trans kids out in the communities and in the schools now than there were 10 years ago, right? Those numbers have gone up. And there is nothing anywhere in our public policy about this epidemic of all the trans kids, right? What is, what is on the policy pages is that if there's any urgency, it's about the fact that this is an underserved population. We public health professionals have fallen down on the job and we have not anticipated and we are not yet meeting the needs of these adolescents and these young adults. And so all of the urgency that's on CDC pages around queer and trans youth, that is all about the urgency of our professions having not yet caught up to serving everyone and basically where we have you know, sort of screwed up and not yet served these populations. The exact same numbers on the autism page, that's all about the urgency in the epidemic and oh my God, there's so many people and there's nothing in there about serving autistic people, right? It's about finding them, hunting them down, labeling di and diagnosing them, right? And there's, it's a fundamentally different posture. And so to go back to your question, you know, what if, you know, we were just, what if this were, you know, regarded more as a, you know, just part of the fabric quite literally as it always has been of human neurological diversity, right? Um, you know, we have models for what that might look like. And in fact, we have models for what it looked like before the AIC. It's yeah. not like there weren't any autistic people yeah. before 1943, yeah. right? Um, so we know what this used to look like. You know, we could yeah. go back to it a little bit. Um, okay, so, and again, just to make sure that we point this out to everyone. so the cost of autism is being sold by those who actually profit from talking about the cost of autism. Yes. So, you know, the cost that they're including are all of the therapies and, you know, different products and ideas that are actually being pushed out to the public in order to maintain this whole profit structure. Right. Yes. Does that make sense? Okay. So, um, I want to go to one of the questions that we have. So Joe, if you could share, I don't know if we're going to be able to get to all Alicia, are you okay on time? Um, they, they'll be mad at me later, but I'll, I'll, I'll mop it up later. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. So we had a couple questions sort of along this theme. Um, so I'm just going to do this one. So it says not all. person may be benefiting from this arrangement if in fact the alternative was unemployment, right? Not being employed in any way. At the same time, this is a mechanism of grooming people into the labor market in a particular niche, 
And in a, if it's not competitive employment, right? If you're being, if, if you have say a particular talent that is being effectively harvested and commodified for the benefit of the corporation and what you're being paid is not a competitive wage, if a non-autistic person displayed that same talent, right? You would probably be given a raise, right? If you're not in a, a competitive uh, wage framework, then maybe that is better than not having any income at all, but it is also functioning at least in part as branding for that company that we have this program where we hire, you know, uh, neurodivergent individuals and lots of companies do that, right? It, it functions, it functions at least in part as a branding exercise. So my, to me, I was like, you know, if, um, if, if you've got autistic people working for you and you don't know it and you don't, and their salary and their wage has nothing to do with whether you think or know that they're autistic or not, we're good. If you have like a program that you're like hiring autistic people and their wages are not commensurate with what other people are doing and you sort of advertise that you have this program, I'm not saying it's bad. I'm saying it is problematic and we should think about it. We should think about who's benefiting because yes, there may be benefits to the autistic people. There are probably also branding benefits to the company. And that is part of the commodification process. And so, you know, these are questions I would like to see um, asked. I would like to see each of us in our own role in the economy to be asking these questions of ourselves and ask, are there ways that we can, in all of this mess, perhaps direct more capital toward autistic people rather than sort of harvesting capital off the backs of autistic people? Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I think this is related to what you presented like early on in your presentation about how just because something is autism acceptance doesn't make it inherently positive. There have to be other things associated with that in right. order to make it like redeemable. I guess. Right. And it's possible that it's deployed as a, you know, to, as I said, as a branding tactic, right? Because reputational capital is a thing. Yeah. Reputational capital raises your, your capital capital, right? So, um, so yeah, I just, these are, these are questions I think we should all ask of ourselves. Yeah. Um, well, I think one, one easy way to tell it, it is how much agency you that company gives to the autistic individual. How much agency the autistic individual gains from being associated with that company? Because equity issues are across the board. I mean, we all, from women in academia yeah. to yeah. non, you know, to color people. You know, this is a general situation that we have in capitalism yes. 101. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, so the amount of agency would give me, be like a thermometer for me to understand, you know, to actually trust what's going on there. Right. Like just yesterday, I saw some commercial with, I was for, for like a cruise line or something, right? We go on this luxury cruise line. We have women captains of our boats and I'm thinking, okay, so you, <laughs> A, are, are, are the female captains making the exact same wage as the male captains? And B, right. <laughs> you're like just totally using this woman in an ad to try to get more people to come to your cruise line as opposed to other cruise lines because the fact that you have at least one um, female captain, you're using that as a marketing ploy to get to bring in more business. And if, the, if in fact that female captain is enriching your revenue, then maybe you should give her a little kickback on her wages. Yep. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Agreed. Um, okay. Where did this question go? Uh, okay. So the next question here was, um, okay. So <laughs> essentially, and I know you're going to love this question. Um, isn't, can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
Isn't Alicia's book or any literature written on the topic of autism part of the AIC? Why do we allow people in the autism industry to not be labeled as part of the AIC? Like, where do we allow them? Is there oh, question? it's totally part of the AIC. But I you guess we kind of just you can't even about that a you know bit. you can't comment on on autism without participating. And I'm I should have said it in the in the presentation, but it's very clear in the book. I'm I'm part of the I'm part of the AIC, right? Um, I, by the way, it's going to be many, 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 many years before, you know, I turn anything like a profit on my book, right? So I'm not like, <laughs> uh, you know, going to be making bazillions of dollars from it, trust me. Um, but, but, but yes, absolutely, absolutely, because autism is a commodity. And so, yes, books about autism, conferences about autism, all of that, um, the, participate in the commodification, absolutely, myself included. I, I acknowledge that, yes. Jen, are okay. you frozen? I think that we're having issues with the internet. All right, I apologize for my internet. Um, I'm gonna okay. go. You're moving again. Okay, <laughs> I'm so sorry. It's not a good day for my internet, I guess. Um, I didn't really hear anything that was said, but I'm going to go to the next question unless one of you was talking more. No, go ahead. Okay. Um, Joe, I don't even know if I sent this one to you yet. Okay. So I'm frustrated by the idea of autistic people increasingly staying outside the diagnostic process as our option for staying away from coercive and commodifying forces. I'm self-identified in my 40s and grieving for what could have been better in the first half of my life and in my never diagnosed parents' lives if we had known we were autistic sooner. And what I want for my kids is for their lives to be better because they know and have access to support sooner. I do not want us to allow diagnostic criteria to exclude high masking autistics because it benefits the AIC. I want to push for more inclusion and support for high masking autistics but the AIC doesn't want that because it doesn't fit with their fear mongering narrative. Do you see any strategies for advocacy that seem likely to work toward these goals? Um, so, just one second, the, the, the uh, audience person understands that this, is, this was a hypothetical what if question right not a proposition right sure sure yes. yeah um, yeah i mean it's like impossible but it was like a what if you did this in a way it's almost like is there a way for people to reject being sucked into this and you did say you kind of you know live off grid in a way but it's like some people do need support and services and and you know want to have the community right I mean, I think there are as many ways of doing this as there are autistic people, <laughs> right? I mean, I think this is really very much, um, as I said, there's, there's no sort of grand redemptive reconstructive narrative here. Um, there's, a lot of, um, there's a lot of subversion, I think, as possibilities. There's a lot of, you know, um, underground work going on. There's also a lot of, you know, injecting yourself into whatever spaces you are, you, you feel safe injecting yourself into, right? So masking has, has really toxic consequences that build up physiological, stressful consequences that build up over time, right? Um, we, we know this and we have, you know, generation upon generation upon generation upon generation of people who have been engaged in masking activities either on their own or because recently in the last, you know, 30 years because they were ABA'd into it, right? Part of that is, is again about changing the mindset of the culture and how we think about about artistic experience and artistic ways of being. And this goes back to the, to the non-binary question, right? I mean, if you look at, you know, 200 years ago, um, people had, you know, an eccentric uncle who was just an eccentric uncle, right? 
and who all the family gatherings were such that the autistic uncle participated in ways that he was comfortable with and oh yeah we do such and such with him when he comes over and you can't be loud in the front room and you can go here and yada, yada, yada. Um, and supports were uh, local they were organic they were primarily devised by families in close kin networks right um, and I think that within autistic communities we have all of these sort of cells of community there's a very cellular network, it's a very disconnected, disjointed, anarchic kind of network, which to be honest, I autistic people are like the ultimate anarchists, right? Um, <laughs> mostly you participate by yourself, but you'll go a little bit here, a little bit here, you've got your own little cells. And that organizational structure, that cellular organizational structure, um, I think is actually really, 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 really valuable and probably a little bit underexploited. Because again, it doesn't have to be hey, I'm going to sign on to some great big monolithic group and get on board with this policy agenda or this activist agenda or this, that, or the other thing. There's a very, very um, loosely distributed, you know, anarchic kind of uh, way of being, you know, if you're autistic, <laughs> right? That sort of lends itself to anarchic kind of uh, resistance and responses. Um, yeah, I don't think that anybody should like feel that they have to uh, not disclose and continue to mask as their only way of, of being outside the, the AIC. That is one tactic that some people employ. I'm not trying to you know, advocate it as something that everyone who can do it should do it. I'm saying that some people who can do that choose to do that. And many who could do it don't. Right. Um, so again, it falls back to me to, you know, there is a lot of autistic agency that can and should be exercised here. Um, but in small, asynchronous, decentralized sort of cellular communities. I think Jen is frozen again. Yeah. There's Jen. Okay. Should we take I mean, maybe, I, maybe I could ask you a question, Alicia, while Jane comes back. Um, the LGBTQ community have been successful in shifting, uh, I don't know, the vision or the, the and it, it's kind of, a community that was in parallel, yep. um, like in, in reading your book, I learned, for example, the origins of these uh, feminine voice conversion therapy in LOVA's initial um, trial of, of uh, ABA. And, and yet it has, uh, so they, it seems to be that it started kind of in a parallel, but it, it, it just deviated in this, uh, and it's now, uh, successful in the sense that the community appreciates that group and embraces it and and it's or at least pretends to or 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 something because it's different definitely different um and it's an evolving uh process but already you can see the progress but but this is not happening in autism and there's overlap, and there's some overlap even. There's a lot of overlap. There's a lot of overlap between yeah. the communities and queer and trans communities. And the central distinction in my reading and my understanding of, of, of the historical analysis is the fundamental difference that caused these divergent trajectories is that autistic people were commodified and queer and trans people were not successfully commodified. Um, that's, that's the, the simple, you know, clearest, and they tried, right? They did try, um, you know, all of the, the same kinds of mechanisms, the same, you know, um, shock mechanisms and whatnot that they used in the Feminine Boys Project and the, the Young Autism Project. Um, 
you know, they were marketing, you know, feral instruments that sold the wireless shockers and all these other things that were involved in YAP. They were, they had ads selling their exact same products targeting, you know, people that were, that were targeting, you know, gay conversion therapy. So that one ultimately didn't take off, right? And um, Jake Pine, who does some really fabulous work on this, I'm going to be doing a different webinar with him and Robin next week. Um, he talks about, ironically, um, that uh, queer and trans communities, you know, became people, right? Became understood and seen as fully human, um, as opposed to, you know, many autistic communities are still not viewed as fully human by non-autistic communities, right? And I talked to him about this and I sort of go one further. I'm like, yes, it's not just that. It is that, but it's not just that. It's that queer and trans communities manage to escape industrial scale commodification which is why i hope that you know anything that can be commodified theoretically should be able to be decommodified right which is why the questions that i want to ask are questions that have at least some potential here and there in distributed uh, kinds of spaces to disrupt the commodification process. And that I, I see that as central. Yeah, I'm back and I'm so sorry for all of my issues. Um, adding to that, can we talk about the resistance to that disruption? Um, because as Liz, you know, sort of mentioned before about, you know, persona non grata, um, you know, anyone who is looking to disrupt these things does face, you know, whether it's resistant, many have faced harassment, um, you know, sabotage, threats, you know, all sorts of things. And um, it really, it, it presents a problem because it's like this, you know, the more powerful, uh, by definition, <laughs> have more power, um, and so, you know, those who are actually trying to resist and, pu and, and, and push back uh, have, you know, much less footing to do so. Um, so, like, what do you think about that? And is there, is there a way for, you know, like, do you feel like those people need to form more of a um, organized co collaborative or what are your thoughts on that? Well, people who have power rarely share it, <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, and all civil rights work, all human rights work through all of human history has always been uphill. I mean, it, it's just, it is what it is. It's the nature of the work. Um, if you're gonna speak truth to power, um, you're gonna get harassed and you're gonna get trolled and you're gonna get intimidated and people are gonna call you a charlatan and people are gonna get, and in my experience, the more shrill they get, you're getting good, you're getting close, right? So you made an impact, right? Um, you, you know, you, they wouldn't bother with all of that if you had no impact, right? So when they get, when they get really shrill, I get a little bit heartened that, okay, um, they wouldn't bother getting shrill with me if they weren't worried <laughs> that whatever I'm doing might have some impact on their bottom line or at least on their power base, right? And yes, absolutely, uh, you know, greater power comes from coalition and collaboration at the same time. I don't think that necessarily that needs to be or should be sort of monolithic. There is no such thing as, you know, the autistic experience, right? Mm -hmm. um, white autistic males who are living in an affluent New Jersey suburb um, probably do not share an awful lot in terms of a policy or activist agenda with women of color who are living in the global South, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. so I, I, I'm mm -hmm. wary of sort of making anything monolithic, because I think that, um, as I said, the diversity is part of the strength and that one needs to engage in one's own collective activities at whatever level and in whatever manner 
one both has access to and is comfortable with. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay, so something else. So again, this is April. Um, a lot of well-meaning people outside of autism, you know, are wanting to show support. Um, I would argue that there's many other more important ways than just wearing a color or something of that sort. But I wanted you to talk a little bit because we've talked about this offline in the past. Um, wearing blue and puzzle pieces and things like that, that, you know, the argument from the autistic community has been, you know, Autism Speaks has harmed us. Um, you know, blue was meant to signify boys, you know, so there's a variety of arguments in that light. But what you also said that I thought was like incredible because I hadn't fully thought of it this way until you pointed it out was that everyone wearing blue and putting up puzzles and, you know, doing these little activities is actually part of the branding. Yeah. So that for people outside of autism, so people outside of autism might think, well, this has nothing to do with me. Why should I care? Tell them why they should care. Because you are participating in, you're being a billboard for Autism Speaks, right? If you, you put on a, you put on a t-shirt with a big, now they're rainbow colored, you know, puzzle piece. Yeah. Um, you send, you know, you send your 20 bucks to the walk, right? Um, by wearing all, by wearing the iconography, you are participating in distributing the brand logo. And the brand of Autism Speaks is that we, uh, you know, this puzzle piece is, is a symbol of, of legitimate authority about autism, right? And if you're wearing it, you know, it's, it's no more different than, you know, you putting a billboard, you know, on the side of your car and driving around and advertising some local business in order for that to happen, they have to pay you, <laughs> right? For you to, to advertise the brand. So, I mean, yeah, people have, somebody said to me, you know, what? Well, I can't figure out why all those children are, are, you know, coloring the puzzle pieces and hanging them up in the school. That doesn't serve anyone. Why are they doing that? I'm like, because they're grooming brand loyalty. Right. That when, when those kids, maybe those kids are eight and they're coloring, but then when they're 18 or 24 and they have a child and they're told that they, they should refer them for an autism evaluation. And then they're like, oh, I don't know anything about autism. Wait. Oh, I remember. Yeah. That place with all the puzzle pieces. Yes. They always knew about autism. And then you go there. Right. There's a there's a long game being played about grooming consumer confidence in a particular brand, right? Mm -hmm. So that is my rationale, my argument for uh, refusing to wear blue, um, <clears throat> you know, refusing the puzzle pieces, all of that. If you wanna make a donation somewhere, make sure that it's um, being directed uh, to an organization that is run by autistic people, for autistic people. Um, you know, same things you would think about if you were going to, you know, donate to any kind of a nonprofit, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think understanding that just because something exists and has a certain narrative, again, you shouldn't make assumptions about what is being done. And more broadly, the reason I bring this up is because I think that a lot of people who either aren't autistic or don't have an autistic family member yet or, um, you know, don't work in this field. It's like, they don't really understand how this actually does directly impact them as well. The AIC, which is all of the, the ideas and the narratives that have been conjured for all of these years, your tax dollars are contributing oh, yeah. to this. Not only that, but like Alicia said, if you're children get diagnosed someday or your niece or your nephew or, or anyone that you? you know, yes, or you, you know, these, these ideas that are being perpetuated and funded and pushed for policy all have a direct impact on what will happen to whatever your connection is. It also may make you more likely to enter the helping field 
in service of these ideas as opposed to in service of autistic people themselves. I tend to be positive about the future. So I think that um, the type of awareness that your work uh, brings um, in, in some case, in some uh, slide, you said, oh, it's cynical at times. Uh, but I think it's very important that people see it for what it is, because that type of awareness is the type of awareness that makes you stop dead and think before agreeing to anything that, um, you know, could actually um, do some damage to your kid unknowingly to you. Yeah. Uh, so we're we're trying to build um, awareness of the of the science in other fields that could provide support and accommodations to people in this field um, and spread the word. Uh, all the, the scientists in other fields in neuroscience and in genomics that don't know about autism uh, are learning now what is going on and you know through the center we're, we're inviting distinguished speakers we're inviting people they're in shock to learn you know what is being claimed as scientific here um so i think that also helps and you know little by little people will begin to see like the this this is like a mask falling and uh and suddenly you start seeing the truth for what it is. And it, like uh, Alfie Kahn said, when he uh, visited us, m many people might, ha might have to gulp and just cope with it and understand the, da the, the, the damage that was done and move forward and try to change this. And then we'll look at it, it as a, you know, and try not to make this mistake again. But, um, but I, I think that in the future, things will be better. And I hope that these organizations that profited so much from autism and that continue to profit, change their narrative and, and change and, and, and help in, in different ways to educate people differently for uh, contributions like your own and, and a different type of science altogether that is more inclusive. So I'll rely my, on your optimism. I'm gonna stay in my cynic lane for now. <laughs> That's good. That it's all it all works. Uh, I think that you need both. Um, and uh, my plan is to convince people to try and collaborate with this different model. And if they don't, uh, we, we move forward with it anyways. We have you know followers, we have people that it's it's the autist autistic community that's working with us, so we can't go wrong with it. Um, can you both so, hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. First, I'm I'm so sorry for all of the issues today. I want to apologize to everyone, including both of you. It is certainly April Fool's Day, um, and um, I just wanted to say that um, Alicia, your I think hopefully we posted the uh, book um, survey link. Joe, can you just make sure? And um, I just want to thank you because this work of yours took um, a couple of decades from what I think you've told me and it I'm a slow it, worker <laughs> no but it's I mean it's it, it's an extensive and critical and thoughtful history and um, I, I think going forward if we can all keep this in mind um, it really will help free a lot of us from this you know, coercive nature of the AIC and hopefully help us to resist it better. So we really appreciate you sharing with us. And um, thank you so much to Liz. We love when you, obviously we love when you come on, but <laughs> um, I love when you come on, especially. And um, I want to thank everyone again for watching. I'm really, really sorry again for my internet issues. And uh, we um, will be back on Thursday.